today. It's four. We did get the thousand dollar grant. We'd like to get another one next year. Please sign this and bring it back to me at your earliest convenience, at least by next week. Okay? Otherwise, you send it in. Can I send it in too? Yes, that'll be fine. Also, I have an announcement. Um, Ross Block was kind enough to tell me at Seton Hall this Sunday there will be an Israeli pianist at 3 p.m. Also at 3 p.m. somewhere else, the Society of Musical Arts will be held at Temple Beth El. And um, that's a free concert. A rehearsal is at 1 and the concert starts at 3. So for people who are interested in either, I have the information. Unfortunately, we couldn't have Professor Herrera today, but fortunately, he got a wonderful replacement. <laughs> um, Professor William Radke, he will discuss philosophy, philosophers, and what they think. And if you remember last week, um, our guest speaker said philosophers, they, they ask questions and ask other questions and no answers. And I told them that he has a tough group because this group is going to demand answers. <laughs> so without further ado, please let's give Professor Rathke a warm welcome and let him Well, thank you very much. I'm not used to a microphone, so I'll try it without. And uh, if you have any trouble hearing me, then I'll try to use the microphone. I was asked to say a, a couple of things about myself. I've been teaching at Seton Hall for about 25 years. I am uh, presently the outgoing chairman of the philosophy department. So Professor Herrera is my esteemed colleague, and he's very sorry he can't be here today. There was a scheduling conflict, and I'll do my best in uh, my poor manner to try to fill in for him. Uh, I think, uh, well, I did my uh, studying at the University of Detroit and the University of Toronto and the University of Fordham. Uh, my main interest lies in logic and analytical philosophy, although I have been trained in scholastic philosophy and uh, American pragmatism, especially the philosophy of John Dewey. So if you want to talk about any of those after I get through talking about what I want to talk about, we'll go into that. Since it was already said disparagingly of philosophers that they go on and on without answering any questions, one question leading to another, I thought I might uh, share with you a couple of uh, quotations that I have gleaned from uh, uh, those writings about philosophy and about philosophers. Uh, in light of what your speaker the other day said, uh, I have gotten this from Ambrose Bierce, who has written The Devil's Dictionary. He defines philosophy as a root of many roads leading from nowhere into nothing. <laughs> nothing like starting out on a positive note. But one of my favorite quotes about philosophy, and this I think gets into what I would like to talk about, is from the uh, Greek historian of philosophy, I think it was in the second century, uh, Diogenes Laertius, who wrote a very chauvinistic history of philosophy. Diogenes Laertius perhaps should be taken with a large grain of salt because for him everything Greek was good and everything non-Greek was bad. But this quote from his history of philosophy I think is uh, worth uh, reflecting upon because I think it raises some points which we might want to get into uh, a discussion of. He says in his history of philosophy, and thus it was from the Greeks that philosophy took its rise. Its very name refuses to be translated into foreign speech. 
Now that's a very powerful statement. He seems almost to be telling us that to do philosophy is to think the way the Greeks think. And as we said, he's a very chauvinist historian. But as a matter of fact, uh, historically speaking, philosophy did begin with the Greeks. And there are those who maintain that the only philosophy is what we call Western philosophy. Now this is a controversial point. Uh, nowadays, people speak of Eastern philosophies and all kinds of philosophies coming from all corners of the world. Unfortunately, I am only trained in Western philosophy. And uh, I'm sure that there is much value in what might be called Eastern philosophy and what might be called other kinds of philosophy. But uh, unfortunately, I don't feel competent to talk about it. So what I would like to do today is just take a kind of bird's eye view over the landscape of what is called Western philosophy as it began in that corner of the universe, which was the uh, Greek city-states. <clears throat> uh, it began around 2,500 years ago. And this recalls another quote from the American philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who says that all subsequent Western philosophy can be regarded as a series of of extended footnotes to Plato. And I, like all good philosophers, am never without my Plato. So I will be brandishing this about, and I was going to say that the copy of the Plato is to any good philosopher what the copy of the Bible is to Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to say that. I decided against saying that. Now, um, before Plato, there was, of course, Socrates. And Socrates is uh, quite a figure. He's, some claim that he is the martyr to what we call free thought or freedom of speech. As a matter of fact, there is a current book written by I.F. Stone called The Trial of Socrates. Now, I.F. Stone is very disturbed about the, the traditional history of Socrates. I.F. Stone is a great uh, lover of the Western democracies as he believed they came down to us from Greece. And it disturbed him that the, uh, the first Western democracy in Greece uh, martyred uh, this hero of free thought and rational discussion. So he had to go back over this and do a kind of post-mortem on the trial of Socrates. The traditional history has it that... Uh, Socrates spoke his mind, and he spoke his mind uh, in the midst of a democracy. But being very critical of the democracy, the democracy arrested Socrates for uh, speaking against the state and speaking against the state religion. Now this, in I.F. Stone's eyes, gives this early democracy a black eye. So he's trying to see if you can uh, reinterpret the uh, history of Socrates' uh, arrest and trial to see who is the villain. And I would recommend that book to you uh, to show you that philosophy is not some abstract, um, off-the-wall uh, discipline that never gets down to earth. As a matter of fact, in Greece, Socrates was uh, ridiculed and made fun of by Aristophanes in a play called The Clouds. And uh, 
in a play called The Clouds, Socrates is depicted as being suspended in a basket in midair, mouthing all of these abstract truths and uh, idealized uh, propositions. The message being that philosophers are those who have their feet planted firmly in midair. <laughs> Now, um, the trouble is that Socrates, who is in some respects the, the patron saint, so to speak, of all working philosophers, in fact, some early Christian fathers wanted to uh, canonize Socrates. He was regarded as a saint before the Christian era. Uh, he represents the... Uh, virtues of the heroic uh, independent thinker, the, the man who follows reason wherever it leads even though it gets him into trouble, as it certainly did. He had to drink the hemlock. Uh, but Socrates wrote nothing, so all we know about Socrates we know through Plato. And everything Plato wrote, he or almost everything he wrote, he put into the mouth of Socrates. Plato wrote his philosophy in a series of dramatic dialogues in which Socrates was the main uh, character. So the, the problem becomes how much of this is Plato's thought and how much of it is Socrates' thought. Uh, well, we don't want to get into that, we'll just treat them as uh, interchangeable up to a point. But before Plato, there was a group of philosophers of whom we have very little uh, extant writings. These have come down to us in the, uh, under the name of the pre-Socratic philosophers. The pre-Socratic philosophers existed some 2,500 years ago, and uh, all we have are little fragments of their works, and people have been making much of these fragments. Some say never has so much been written about so little as about the pre-Socratics. But I want to just say a few things about the pre-Socratics in order to give a kind of historic background to the philosophy of Plato. The pre-Socratic philosophers began with a group called the uh, physical philosophers, or the physical thinkers, those thinkers who tried to uh, examine the problems concerned with what we today call physics, or physical nature. And the problem was, how is it possible that the things we see around us uh, come into being and pass out of existence? This became the problem. The word physics, we take from the Greek Theomai, which means to be born, or to come into being. The Latin translation of this uh, physics, the Greek physics, the Latin translation is natus. You know your natal day is the day you were born. So something comes into being. That, according to these first thinkers, presented a problem. How is it that the universe came into being? From what did the universe come? come into being. If the universe is all that there is, whence did it come? And if it is all there is, the only place it could come from was nothing. But if you have nothing to begin with, you'll net get nothing in the end. So this was the problem. Now, of course, there were answers to this problem, but this, these answers were taken from the religious poets of the Greeks, Homer and Hesiod. And the answer was that the universe as we know it is somehow a product of some kind of uh, stress and strife among the gods and the titans and so on. But this was the religious answer. So around 600 BC, uh, there began what is called a break away from the religious answer to 
what we nowadays might call the big questions. Where did it all come from? An attempt to use one's own reason only, nothing else, to come to some kind of an answer to the question, what is the origin of the universe? What is uh, the place of human nature in the universe? So instead of taking these answers from the religious poets, they decided, well, what can we find out using our own reason? Now some say this is, this is how philosophy began, a breakaway from religion. And uh, the story goes that one of the earliest of these philosophers, his name was Pythagoras, was walking along one day. Again, this comes from Diogenes Laertius, and he's full of a lot of legends and myths and stories. And a lot of, they're very interesting stories, but how true they are, we don't know. He says that Pythagoras was considered to be the greatest uh, thinker of his day. And somebody called out from the crowd, Oh, you're such a wise man, Pythagoras. And Pythagoras turned and said, Well, call no man wise but God alone. Rather, I am a lover of wisdom. Philae Sophia. And, they, and according to Diogenes Laertius, that he invented the word philosophy by saying he, he was not a wise man, but only God could be wise, and he was rather a lover of wisdom. I don't know how true it is, but it's a nice story. The first philosopher, by tradition, is Thales, who lived around 600 B.C. And uh, there are a lot of stories about Thales, one that he predicted a, uh, a, uh, uh, a drought or something, and he cornered all the, uh, the uh, uh, presses for the olive uh, uh, industry and made a lot of money. Another story is that Thales was contemplating the stars one night and was walking along and he fell into a cistern. And some serving maiden came along and he wanted to get out, and she laughed at him and saying, you are looking at the stars, but you don't know what's going on underneath your own feet. Now, these stories have a certain point to them. The fact that Thales could corner the <coughs> olive presses and make a lot of money was perhaps invented to show that, well, philosophers did have some kind of practical no If they wanted to, they could make a lot of money. We philosophers like to think that. The story goes when, not the story, but most uh, professors, as Dr. Duff can attest to, when they're out in the uh, social circuit, when you meet these uh, businessmen who say to you, if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Right. And one professor said, well, if you're so rich, why aren't you smart? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that story may, the story of his uh, cornering the olive presses may have been that type of story. And in fact, of course, the story of his falling into the cistern is a typical uh, anecdote to illustrate the image that philosophers had at that time, which you may notice hasn't changed over these 2,000 years. Now, uh, Thales and his uh, and the subsequent philosophers tried to say, well, how can we solve the, the problem of change? If the universe comes into being, how do we get from nothing to something? And uh, their answer boiled down to some that really it boiled down to saying, well, uh, there is no absolute beginning of the universe. The universe is at bottom a single substance, as if you had a clay, and then you could shape this clay into many different artifacts. So the universe is at bottom some material, some stuff. They gave this stuff different names. Thales said water. Now why would he say water is the stuff of the universe? Well, Aristotle tried to explain it, and Aristotle said, well, he looked at... Uh, living things and saw that moisture is the source of growth among living things. If you have this seed that you find uh, 
dried up and it's been there for centuries. If you moisten it, all of a sudden it grows. And when your lamp runs dry, you don't get any light anymore. Now all of a sudden you have the, uh, the main elements, the fire of the lamp, the moisture, the earth or clay, and the air. So these became the basic uh, materials out of which they said the universe was formed. One philosopher said, well, it wasn't water, it was air. And the way, in order to say that uh, uh, air was the original stuff of the universe, I'm not in order to say it, but he said it in order to give a mechanistic explanation of how these differences came about. How can you get from one single substance the great variety of things we see all around us? So we see animals, vegetables, plants, stars, everything so different from one. How can they all come from a single substance? Well, the philosopher who thought he had the answer by saying it was air said by rarefaction and condensation. So he saw that you could uh, compress air or you could make it rarer, less compressed. So here was a mechanical explanation of non-mechanical phenomena. So this led to just different people having different opinions as to how the universe got started. How did we get the way we are today? They all agreed that there was a difference. The earlier you, you push things, everything is going to be different. If you could take a thought, imaginary journey back to the beginning, things would be entirely different. You would have, instead of all of the different animals and plants and humans and so on, you would have only the elemental things, the fire or the air or the water or the clay. So things are different in the beginning, somehow through some kind of, of process, some kind of, of uh, mechanical uh, doings, whether it was the shaking up of all these elements mixed together in an original uh, mess, so to speak, a mess of pottage, some mechanical way, the turning of the spheres, things got sorted out. So. The way things are today is not the way they are in the beginning. But it is a perpetual, eternal process. Because the, the stuff of which the universe is made is alive. It is a vital plasm, whether it's air or water or clay or what have you. It is alive. It has within it the source of its own generation, its own movement. And this is what the Greeks meant by thesis, nature, from which we get our word physics. So it was a, a living, vital substance. But along comes Parmenides, who perhaps, according to some, is the greatest thinker before Socrates and Plato. And he put an end to all this speculation because Parmenides said that from nothing you get nothing. There cannot be any change because what we're talking about is being. And being just is. You cannot say of being that it is not. And you cannot even think of anything unless what you're thinking about is. So Parmenides is uh, credited with the discovery of this concept being. And according to some, this is the, uh, the deepest insight uh, of philosophy. And it's also what gives philosophy its bad name. This is what some people call metaphysics. And when you hear the word metaphysics, it's usually a word of put-down. Oh, that's too metaphysical. We can't think about it. But uh, 
according to Parmenides, it's the only thing you can think about. Because it, unless there is being, there's nothing to think about. And if you're thinking, you must be thinking about something. But what this leads to is the impossibility of change. So you have what might be called a crisis in philosophical speculation. We have the process going on around us, the cosmic, physical process of generation and uh, corruption, birth and death. This is the most obvious thing, the thing that we all experience, birth and death, where there was not something, now there is something. So we're walking along outside and where there was not a few, uh, few weeks ago, there was not any of those little green things pushing their way up. Now there is. Now there's the little green spikes coming up. That's change. That's physical reality. That is the most obvious thing we experience. As one philosopher put it, change is the life of the universe. But, according to Parmenides, change is impossible. Tony, could you write his name on the Google? No, no, I can't see. Oh, I don't like him. I don't like him. No, I don't like him. Our amenities. She's calling me. She's calling me. No, but I know. Now I know. Now I know. So Parmenides is saying that you can't have change, you can't have uh, the physical process. Well then, this undermines uh, our experience. The things we see and feel and touch, according to Parmenides, are unreal. According to Parmenides, what is real is just being, and what is being is what is. And if it is, it, it cannot come into being. It cannot go out of being. It's just one immense uh, self-subsisting. He, he described it in a metaphorical way as an all-encompassing sphere. Having, there, there, you can't even point to one, si one side of it and say that side is more or less being than the other side. That's why the sphere is the best metaphorical image that he could think of. Uh, so, being then is all that there is. Now what is he saying? He's saying all that there is simply is. There is no past, no future. There is no time at which you can say it was not. And it wouldn't be what it is. It wouldn't be being. What is it? It's being. And what happens is that we, according to Parmenides, we mortals, think up names, and we are sort of uh, sucked in by our own language, and think that we, because we can name things differently, that things must be different. So he's saying that there is something called convention, tradition, and what he's saying is to get at reality, you have to go against convention, you have to go against tradition. You have to think only of that which can be thought logically. And what can be thought logically is only being is, non-being is not. There are two ways, as he put it, two ways of going. You can choose the way of being, which cannot not be, or you can choose the way of not being, which necessarily is not. That double talk? <laughs> well, quite the contrary. It's even it's too simple. It's so simple that when you try to put it into words, you become double talk. Now, according to another philosopher, Heraclitus, who is sometimes uh, mentioned in the mentioned in the same breath with Parmenides as his opponent, 
although historically there is no evidence that uh, the two of them ever uh, were uh, in combat. Heraclitus refused to say that anything is. They were the same era, the same life. Roughly the same, but they were in other different parts of the Greek Empire. Uh, he said that uh, nothing is. All there is is this process. A process. Now his image, now, now notice, they have these images, like Parmenides had the image of a complete, full sphere, having no, uh, so he calls it a well-worked ball, having no uh, more or less in any part than in any other part. It's just complete plenum, a fullness. The image that, that Heraclitus had was fire. So reality is like fire, one substance exchanging for another substance. So the image of reality is just this process, fire. And the whole purpose of the human existence is to understand how change process rules all. Once you understand that, then you can understand the hidden law of reality. And this is, has a moral message that what we have to do is we have to find our way through the ever-changing universe. It's almost like saying, you know, when to jump, when to jump right, and when to zig, and when to zag. Because now, it, one day you're up, and another day you're down. Whatever goes up has to come down. So there is no permanence. There is no being. There is no uh, reality except change. Now, Socrates and Plato inherited this kind of intellectual background. This, I spoke about this crisis. Now, you can take Parmenides and Heraclitus and say, well, these, these are the two extremes. Either the only reality is being, and then out the door goes physics, cosmology, common sense, sense experience. You can't trust your senses. Or the only thing that is real is change. And then out the door goes permanence. There is nothing to rely on. There is no substance which is doing the change. Now, uh, Socrates felt that whatever philosophy is, it must teach humans how to live. We must examine our lives to see where we fit into the scheme of things. Socrates' famous saying, the unexamined life is not worth living. That to be truly human is to use your mind to reflect on the purpose of life. Not to solve these speculative, theoretical questions about physics or cosmology or things like that. All of these are sub, uh, submitted to the higher purpose of things. What kind of life is the best life for me to live? That was Socrates' message. He wanted to turn everything into a moral direction. And he uh, put down the speculative, theoretical questions what we might today call metaphysics or ontology. To him, the burning issue was the moral issue. He went around collaring everybody he could get a hold of and asking them, well, what do you mean when you say that so-and-so is just, or this is the right thing to do, or this is uh, virtuous, or this is courageous? When we want to live the good life, we have to know what we're doing. We, and the good life is a life of virtue. And the virtues are such things as justice and courage and wisdom. But in order to live a life of justice and courage and wisdom, we have to know what justice is and what courage is and what wisdom is. But everybody that Socrates met, he says, now again, when we say Socrates says this, this is in Plato's dialogues, his dramatic 
presentations of Socrates' debates with his fellow Greeks. Everybody he questioned thought they knew what courage was, but when he pressed them, they couldn't give a rational, logical account of it. So Socrates goes, Socrates goes around looking for the answer to the question, what is the best kind of life to live? Which he says boils down to the question, what is virtue? Now, what virtue is turns out to be knowledge. Virtue, in other words, let's take the example of courage. What is courage? Well, if you take courage, you know that a person can have a fighting spirit and can be running into the face of the enemy but not accomplish anything. And to show his courage, he might even want to go in barehanded without any arms. But that's foolishness. That's not courage. So uh, the idea of courage is knowing who your enemy is, knowing what you need to defend yourself. So instead of having this foolhardiness, this mere macho uh, aggressiveness, you have to have a certain aggressiveness that is tempered by knowledge. So in every example that Socrates uses, it is knowledge that makes the difference between somebody who doesn't or is it, isn't able to live the good life and somebody who has the know-how to live the good life. And Plato makes the good life the know-how. <coughs> An expertise, a skill. And how to accomplish this skill is the whole message of Plato's philosophy. Now, Plato was inspired by Socrates' martyrdom to turn away from the life of politics that his aristocratic uh, birth had him meant for and devote his life to philosophy. Why? Because he thought, well, the famous saying, what makes life worth living? What kind of life can we live unless our society is the kind of society that cultivates virtue and the good life? If we live in a savage society, you know, a society that is marked by violence and lawlessness, then the, the good life is impossible. So the key to the good life is having a society that is well regulated, an ordered society. And what is the key to that? The key to that is knowing what he calls the forms. You may have heard of Plato's theory of the form, sometimes called the theory of ideas. And this perhaps is the central uh, point that would launch us into what has come to be known as philosophical speculation. Now, according to Plato, look at us. We're all members of the same type of being. And what type of being do you call that that we are all members of? The human being. All right, so... We are, all of us, individuals of a type. <coughs> now, let's take a, an example that is very down-to-earth and very homespun. Let's suppose that you look at a printer's, uh, what do they call it, where they keep all the letters? Ah, wow. I knew it was uh, something very technical. The printer's box of letters. Now, if you ask for the letter E, he goes and he finds a whole bunch of little things. But not, none of them is the type. They are all individuals of the same type. What is that type? It's not these 
because you can find that type in another box, in another state, or in another town. This type is something over and above the individuals. For example, one uh, teacher of philosophy uses this kind of example. He says, well, write your name on the board. Okay, you write your name on the board. Now, the question he asks then is, is that your name? And you say, yes, that's my name. He says, okay. Now you don't have a name. <laughs> I just erased your name. But then that's not my name, is it? How many names do you have? Well, every time you write this down, are you writing another name? If you write your name twice, are you writing the same thing twice? Or are you writing two different things? Now this is what Plato means by a form or idea. He says, you and I are only individual representatives of something else, the human nature, which is not identical with you or me, because you and I will soon not be around. But what is human remains forever. And Many years ago, we were not around, but what is human was unchanged. So this uh, form, the idea, is what we would call a type. So the notion of a type, or form, or idea, is a notion of something that is not what you can see, what you can handle, like you can handle those letters in the box, the letter E is not any one of those letters. Each one of them represents the letter E. But what is this letter E? It's something Plato calls the thing itself. For example, you say, well, what is this? This is a microphone. But it is not the microphone itself. Because you could destroy it and what a microphone is would not be destroyed. So this uh, introduces a world that is beyond the world of space and time. The world of ideas. The world of forms. And according to Plato, we live in, well, I don't know how to put it again without getting into double tongue. We, we exist in a sense, we exist in two worlds. We exist in the world of individuals, things that you can handle, you can see, you can touch, the world of sensible things. But at the same time, there is another world, the world which he calls the world of reality, the world of ideas. Now, each individual... Would that, would that be the... The uh, word uh, concept instead? No, you see, and, concept and is what you think of something. But what I think of something is not necessarily what it is. I may think, for example, that uh, a planet is something that is describing a circular orbit. But that's not what a planet is. That's My concept of a planet is not necessarily what a planet is. But the concept comes into existence as soon as you have the concept. And that even though it may well, the have concept the true, is a true existence of it, it, no, it, still, it still has been the existence of a concept of a, a uh, concept is different from idea. You're conceiving something. And uh, existence, whether it's true existence or whether it's... Existence. Well, the concept is not true existence. No. no, but I mean... That's what, what he's after. after. He's after existence. true existence. But when it goes from concept into existence, I mean, if I have an idea of making an invention or uh, some kind of new thing, I have to conceive it first, and once I conceive it, then I make it into reality. Well, that's, that's uh, if, if you're talking about Plato's philosophy, I don't think Plato would admit or would grant you the ability 
to have that kind of creativity. All you're doing is imitating this ultimate reality. In other words, you've been given some kind of uh, insight, some kind of peek behind the curtain, so to speak. And that, to me, is the difference between the Platonic philosophy, the philosophy of Plato, and some kind of philosophy that is more open to individuality and creativity. The question is, and I, I get this with my students, and, and I can never understand this, I will ask my students, before whoever it was who invented music, before music was invented, was there music? And they all say, yes, there was. I think we're all born Platonists. But the students will never admit that we humans can create a whole new reality. The question is, can we? And again, I only have the questions. But there was music. Every sound well, I, what I mean by this is, you have the, the, the scale, you have the measures, you have the uh, different uh, uh, values of the different notes and the different keys and everything. They're, they're all human. Well, I don't know. If you if you hear a jackhammer, is that music? It could be. Well, again, that's, this gets back to the the other the earlier philosophers who I think uh, were more or less uh, precursors of Plato's philosophy. It was the Pythagoreans who. Uh, said that there was the music of the spheres, that the planets and the moon and the stars and everything revolving around their spheres made a music. And the question is, if the music is being made, how come we don't hear it? What about birds? Birds brought music in. That was music. Well, it gets down to how you're going to define music, of course. You mentioned reality with ideas. Now, I, I'm just asking you. Ideas are something that you can see, whereas reality, you can. Is that well, the question is, wow, this is good, because now I can pull out my Bible. <laughs> there is a point in this dialogue of Plato, which I think is the point we may have reached. Uh, Plato is not, well, the here he has other people besides, him, besides uh, Socrates, he has a, uh, this is a dialogue called the Sophist. How do you spell that? The Sophist, S-O-P-H-I-S-T. And uh, they reach a point here, uh, I'll just pick it up in, the, in Medias Res here, uh, the stranger, the Athenian stranger who may represent uh, Parmenides philosophy. He says, and countless other difficulties, each involved in measureless perplexity, will arise. You see, the question is without end. Uh, if you say that the real is either two things or only one. So they're testing what is the real? Is it is it one or is it more than one? Is it true or untrue? Oh, it's different than real. Well, perhaps it is. Uh, but, for example, some might say, well, reality is only one thing, say matter. And others may say, no, reality is two things, matter and something immaterial. So it's, it's dual. Now, this is the kind of thing they're, they're but that's not the point we're trying to make here. Uh, and the reply is, that is plain enough from those we have had a glimpse of now. One leads to another, and each carries us further into a wilderness of doubt about every theory as it is mentioned. <coughs> so, so much then for those who give an exact account of what is real or unreal. We have not gone through them all, but let this suffice. 
Now we must turn to look at those who put the matter in a different way, so that from a complete review of all, we may see that reality is just as hard to define as unreality. So notice he's got two, two different elements here, which Parmenides would never admit. Parmenides says there's only one, and it's reality. Now Plato is trying to say, well, Parmenides may have an insight, but it's not the whole story. Because we must admit some kind of not being in order to do justice to our experience. Because we know that from the not being of something comes something. From whence do you get a baby? From that which is not a baby. The sperm and the ovum. They are not a baby. But in a way they are. They both are and are not. Mm -hmm. And that's what Parmenides would say. That's, that's a contradiction. Something cannot be both be and not be. So here's Plato wrestling with this as you might say, double talk. Duality. We had better go on then to their position. And the stranger says, what we shall see is something like a battle of gods and giants going on between them over their quarrel about reality. So he's giving an image of the opposing philosophers. One he calls gods and the other he calls giants, which of course is an echo of the Grecian myths before the Titans and the gods. So he's going to favor one of these, guess which? Uh, a battle of gods and giants going on between them over their quarrel about reality. How so? One party is trying to drag everything down to earth out of heaven and the unseen, literally grasping rocks and trees in their hands where they lay hold upon every stock and stone and strenuously affirm that real existence belongs only to that which can be handled and offers resistance to the touch. They define reality as the same thing as body. And as soon as one of the opposite party asserts that anything without a body is real, they are utterly contemptuous and will not listen to another word people you describe are certainly a formidable crew. I've met quite a number of them before now. Yes, and accordingly their adversaries are very wary in defending their position somewhere in the heights of the unseen, maintaining with all their force that true reality consists in certain intelligible and bodiless forms. In the clash of argument, they shatter and pulverize those bodies which their opponents wield. And what those others allege to be true reality, they call not real being, but a sort of moving process of becoming. On this issue, an interminable battle is always going on between the two camps. So what is real? The gods, I mean, he calls these the gods, I guess they, they would be called the Platonists, maintain that true reality is this unseen intangible. For example, somebody wins a medal for bravery. Is that bravery? Well, according to Plato, no. That is just an instance of true bravery, which is eternal. It is immaterial. It is an imitation of bravery, a participation in the form bravery. Because this person could turn into a coward the next day. But bravery never becomes cowardice. You may go down to Atlantic City in September and see the crowning of Miss America. Is that beauty? No. Well, come around in 35 years. It fades. But does beauty fade? No. Now, of course... <laughs> well, if you want to give the answer, I, I'm not here to say what is true or false, but if you want to give the answer of Plato, he says, what is beauty can never become unbeautiful. So therefore, what we see cannot be reality. So there is reality and then there is something really real. There is the real and then there's the really real. What would you call it? The ideal. I mean, because it's yeah, that's the idea. 
The word idea comes from the Greek word which originally meant form, that which can be seen, but it's only... See, another thing Plato is saying is that we only have human eyes and we only have human language and we only use human words. But what we're trying to describe is something on the other side of the curtain. The Greek word for truth is aletheia, the unveiling on the other side of the curtain. As long as we're in this world, we can never describe this true reality. So, who was it that said truth is beauty, beauty? Keats? Truth is beauty. My uh, uh, friend of my friend, though. Keats said that, right? Yeah. Keats. Well, I didn't know him with ideas. Is this the same in, uh, please don't say it, is this the same in Plato? Is his definition of what is the soul? The well, the soul, <laughs> each one of us has a soul which resembles the ideas. It is more like the ideas, but the ideas are something over and above, something more real than the soul. How do we know that? How can we each one of us has a soul? Well, so, how <laughs> much time do you have? <laughs> That's another question. Right. That's another Another, uh, there is a dialogue. Soul which, was synonymous with person. Was in, in other languages, when one refers to a person's person, they interchange the word soul. That's Some say, say it's the a real self. Soul. But if you want to, person. The thing to do. In, there are two dialogues. One called the Phaedo, which. Uh, recounts Socrates' last hours on earth. Why was he, why did they say that? Well, he was, he was uh, convicted of, uh, of uh, corrupting the youth and uh, preaching atheism against the state religion. And he was condemned to drink the hemlock. Now, the day he drank, uh, drank the hemlock, all his friends gathered around, and they had a touching conversation about mm -hmm. immortality. And there is where Plato tries to prove the immortality of the soul. And part of his proof is that we know these immaterial objects, the true, the good, the beautiful by itself. Therefore, we must have experienced them because we never experience them on this earth. Would, it, would, it, would this be all before or after finality? Much before. Much before. I mentioned that Socrates and Plato lived before 600 BC. Uh, Socrates and Plato lived in the fourth century BC. Before. Or about 400. Well, who Socrates died in 399. Who, re <laughs> who recorded and how did they do? Well, Plato is the only philosopher that early that we have uh, his work. How did they do it? On their papyrus. The scrolls, yes. May I ask you a question? Take the concept of the uh, deaf or deep people who want to have a president who is herself deaf. Now, does that convey the concept of what to them is real? Maybe a person who can't hear? as against to us who considers a person a person who does hear. You get what do you want? Yeah, what do you, do you want to, I want to, know to discuss it in Plato's I, terms or in an absolute sense? In the absolute <laughs> term, you have two concepts here of, pe of people. People who are deaf and people who are not deaf. Well, the easy well, answer is, is that's politics and I don't get into that. <laughs> Again, uh, Plato would say that the person who is deaf is just another manifestation of the incompleteness and limitation of our human uh, experience. So he would prefer somebody who has all of their faculties. But Plato is the is the father of totalitarianism, so I don't want to get into that. 
Did you have to study Greek in order to understand the true interpretation well, of Well, you Latin? had to uh, at least study vocabulary, Greek vocabulary. Yeah, because uh, sometimes translation doesn't follow. But I, my Greek is not that good. I depend on translation. There's another book which is uh, published by uh, a uh, uh, professor at NYU. It's called uh, Dictionary of Greek Philosophical Terms. And in it, he, uh, he has a little <coughs> philosophical essay in each. It's, the term is written in our alphabet. And it's, it's sort of uh, phonetically spelled. And each one has a little essay, which gives you the history of the Greek term and so on. Can't think of his name. <laughs> now, I think we've raised enough questions so that I can end the formal part of my talk, and we'll have further discussion if you wish. said by many that they did. Um, it's a very complicated uh, and complex question. Whether the question is, did Plato and Aristotle retard the progress of science? A lot of people say they did. They changed the direction. Now, Plato <laughs> is, you know, he's, he's of heroic proportion. Not only is he so good, he's also so bad. I mean, he's done a lot of evil and a lot of good. He, he's, a, he's a personage of, of many facets. Now, some accuse Plato of fathering totalitarianism. And others say, no, you know, Plato is the father of Western civilization and culture and democracy and everything else. I might recommend another book called The Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl Popper. Karl Popper wrote this book during the Second World War, and he said that was his contribution to the war effort. He tried to show how totalitarianism, as it was manifest in the Second World War, can be traced back to Plato. See, Plato believed that in order to have, uh, this is the, I, I, I got into this in mid-sentence because I said, well, how do we have this, this law and order society? Well, you find out the truth. And this famous saying, until philosophers become kings or the rulers learn philosophy, we will never have a just society. Now, he devoted his life, he founded the academy, to train the future leaders of society. In order to be a leader of society, you had to learn Platonic philosophy, which is based on the forms. So the forms are this reality writ large in heaven. So he wasn't interested in what we today would call experimental science. Now Aristotle was. But uh, whether Aristotle was responsible for retarding the progress of science or the Aristotelians, the ones who came after him. See, he is not to be blamed for those who made him into a, a god or a godlike figure. That Aristotle, whenever he said, that's it, we don't know whether, that, whether he would have liked that. Maybe he would have. I don't know. That's human, I suppose. And that's what the church did, didn't it? Galileo well, and others were, uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, uh, the church was, was coming to grips with the relation between faith and reason. And Aristotle represented reason. He was the authority. Along came St. Thomas Aquinas and said, well, I can reconcile Aristotle and faith. So that Aristotle became the authority. Now along comes somebody like Galileo who tries to develop a new system. And what 
he finds is nobody will listen to him because they have Aristotle, so they don't have to listen to him. And the story goes, again, how true it is, I don't know. He discovered uh, spots in the sun, and he discovered crags in the moon. Now, according to Aristotle, celestial bodies are perfect, so they can't have these crags. And according to the story, the Aristotelians refused to look into Galileo's telescopes because Aristotle said it couldn't be, and therefore it wasn't. Copernicus, who was a cleric himself, was smart enough to have his theory published after he died. <laughs> you see, uh, the church followed Aristotle in the belief that the earth is the center of God's creation. Now, that sounds good from a religious point well, of view. It's not only Aristotle, it's, it's the Bible. The Bible doesn't speak of a solar system. Well, the Bible it's speaks Aristotle of Aristotle well, does. One of the uh, <coughs> judges or prophets making the sun stand still, and if it's not moving, then why make it stand still? That's what stood in the way of the Copernican being accepted. Because Copernicus says the sun is stationary, the earth is moving around. Now the Bible says he commanded the sun to stand still. Well, if the sun isn't moving, it's nonsense to command it to stand still. But That's why they the wouldn't accept a Copernicus. The Aristotelian theory that was held, that the sun is the center of the solar system, all the planets and the moon go around the sun, you see. And that was based on beliefs of Aristotle. Well, Aristotle based on Ptolemy. Um, he didn't go into it himself, he just accepted the going the theory of the day, which was the Ptolemy system. So the bad system. thing was for them to say, it's already been decided. We mustn't investigate any different explanations. This is it. It's been said by Aristotle. And that's dangerous. And anyone who tries to think differently is in trouble. Well, Socrates found that out, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> what was the... <laughs> What was the source of the basic conflict between the philosophy as set forth in the Bible and the philosophy? Well, that again, whether the Bible, <laughs> it, it is a Jewish philosophy. Well, says, no, no. The, the question becomes the whether the Bible is intended to set forth a philosophy, and that became a point of dispute among both Jews and Christians. There are those that say the Bible is not intended to set forth a philosophy. No, no. That you can separate philosophy from the Bible and never the twain shall clash. Others said, we don't need philosophy because we can get our philosophy from the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's not, there, there's no uh, uniform <coughs> opinion as to whether or not there is a clash. Mm -hmm. Certainly I would say the majority found that there was a clash between what they called faith and what they call the music. Why is Galileo excommunicated from the church because of the roundness or squareness of the earth? Who established the fact at that time whether it was round or square? And why did they... Well, again, it, it, Galileo wasn't excommunicated. Galileo recanted. The story goes, he knelt before the Pope and said, you're right, the uh, earth stands still, and then as he walked away, he muttered on his bed, but it moves. <laughs> <laughs> Galileo was kept under house arrest for the rest of his life. And he was not allowed to publish now. But he did keep himself within the church. Now, my understanding is that it went against the official... In other words, can you have a philosophy and or science? See, in those days, they didn't distinguish between philosophy and science. This was just the beginning of science breaking away from philosophy. Can you have a philosophy of science which is independent of religion? Like today, we have creationism versus evolution and, and so on. Now, in those days, they would say, you can't have. There's only one truth. And if there is a possibility of clash between what you say in your philosophy and what is scripture or religious authority, then you have to submit to religious authority because there's one God and one truth. Well, who decided what was right? <laughs> Scripture? 
Well, the Cardinals and the Pope. The Jews had, Spino had trouble with Spinoza. Or Spinoza had trouble with the Jews. He was excommunicated. And he was called an atheist, but there's there's nobody who's more concerned about God than Spinoza. Some call one person called Spinoza the God intoxicated philosopher. But he, he turned been. everything into God. You take Parmenides, one being. Spinoza said, we have a name for it. Deus sibe natura. God, or another name, nature. He had a negative kind of philosophy. He said, I, I think he said it. Happiness is freedom from pain. Well, he didn't regard it as negative. No. Free thought was his ideal. And his whole idea was to get away from this negativism. That free thought was, was actually becoming united with this Deus Sive Natur, rising above the limitations of flesh and uh, society and so on. It's negative the way we look upon it. But freedom to him was a very positive thing. In other words, if you didn't have pain, you, then you, you're happy. But there was more to it than that, I'm okay. sure. It was, it was, that was just a stepping stone toward the... Uh, you. How did these philosophers, did they conflict in any way with the pagan religion at the time? I mean, did they, did they just went on well, one, one, uh, one historian said that uh, that when when the Greeks created their philosophy, they lost their religion. Uh, it is substituted for religion. Now, Socrates was in conflict with the authorities. But if, according to some, in those days, religion was used by the state. But the educated intellectual person was very casual about their religion. It wasn't the burning issue in a personal way. But it was a, a, a very powerful... Uh, well, civic and state force. Some say the Greeks were so uh, casual about their religion, and some attribute that as the cause of why it was among them that philosophy arose, because it didn't have any qualms about speculating, using reason, and forgetting about what, whether that contradicted religion. There was no emotional. See, what Plato wanted to do is wanted to have a religion based on reason. He wrote another dialogue called The Laws, and he wanted to make irreligion, he wanted to outlaw irreligion, because he said that leads to delinquency and lawlessness. But he said, first we have to prove that there is a God, and so he's a proof for the existence of God, while at the same time he's outlawing irreligion.